Well, if you're looking for supermen, real men of steel, just go to the 1960s and to the Gemini astronauts. I mean, the true pioneers of space. Without Gemini, there would be no Apollo. And long duration flights. And up to two weeks, as it says here. 14 days, in fact. There were three long-duration missions, four days on Gemini 4, eight days on Gemini 5, the length of a lunar mission, and an extended mission of 14 days on Gemini 7. Long duration was a test of the endurance of both spacecraft and crew. On the spacecraft side, Gemini 5 was powered by fuel cells for the first time. They replaced conventional batteries. And what's truly amazing about Gemini is they had two vehicles up at once and they rendezvoused. First ever rendezvous in space. And they came, would you believe it or not, a foot from each other. The old 12. There's lots of 12 attached to this uh, particular part of the mission. The first rendezvous in space occurred December 15, 1965, between two spacecraft, Gemini 6A and Gemini 7. Over Hawaii, in the fourth orbit, Pilot Stafford reported the decreasing distance between the two spacecraft. 120 feet. Holding 120 feet, Wally. As station keeping continued, Gemini 6A moved within a foot of Gemini 7. It was a successful beginning which saw Gemini complete ten rendezvous with target vehicles in less than a year. Seven different modes were investigated. Yes, six A and seven, and seven different modes. Six A, of course, sixty-one. An eleventh rendezvous to photograph a solar eclipse was achieved on Gemini 12. To those of us who followed the flights from the sidelines, listening to reports from television, Rendezvous seemed almost like an automatic exercise. But because something is done well, does not mean that it was easy to do. Rendezvous required three years of theoretical preparation, integrating space mathematics into the constraints of the mission and hardware. Approximately 100,000 hours were spent on computer computations. When crews were assigned to specific rendezvous flights, each prime and each backup crew trained for approximately 400 hours in simulators, a total of almost 5,000 man-hours of rendezvous simulators. That's truly amazing that people would spend 14 days in this uh, Gemini capsule. This is truly a man of steel. It's truly amazing at 17,000 miles an hour, they got to one foot of each other. During the first rendezvous, Gemini 6A had moved within one foot of Gemini 7, but of course the two spacecraft could not dock. The first space dock came in March 1966. The spacecraft was Gemini 8. Astronaut Armstrong moves in very slowly, making his final approach, until he's about three feet from the target. He then holds his position, reading the status display panel on the Agena. When he docks, the Gemini Agena configuration will remain stable for almost 30 minutes. The control problems which developed were unrelated to the first successful dock in space. Gemini completed nine successful dockings. Both crew members performed dockings on the final two missions, 11 and 12. One important aspect of docking is that it allows a crew to utilize the propulsion system of another spacecraft for further maneuvers. The Agena target vehicle has a primary propulsion system with 16,000 pounds of thrust. The primary propulsion... 16,000 uh, of thrust. Incredible, incredible technology, 1966. The principal goals remain to send two men into space for up to 14 days, which was roughly the time it would take to go to the moon, to perform a spacewalk, or properly an EVA, or extravehicular activity, so that men could actually walk around on the moon, and also to rendezvous and dock with another spacecraft, since this is what astronauts would have to do in orbit around the moon. Not Gemini 
3 was the first manned Gemini to be launched. It had been preceded by two earlier unmanned test flights. Ten manned test flights would tackle six objectives. The program would investigate long-duration flight, develop rendezvous techniques and post-docking maneuvers, develop re-entry flight path control, develop extravehicular capability, attain flight and ground crew proficiency, and conduct scientific experiments. And even though it was a very serious thing, of course, the men of steel still managed to have fun. And here they are with their Soviet compatriot, Yuri Gagarin. And uh, you can see it looks like President Johnson. And they're doing the old tea shake. Yes, and here is the dimensions. Incredible job these guys have done. You can see here, 90 inches wide. And some incredible mathematics that goes into these missions and precision equipment are here. And you can notice here three, and then nine, eleven, so two, and then twelve, three, three, two, three. That gives you eight, eight, and of course seven. Incredible how the maths all work in these things. And uh, ninety inches. I just measured myself across the shoulders, and it was just under twenty-eight inches. Uh, so. Double that's around uh, 60, of course, and you have 90. So what incredible uh, men they were for two weeks in that sort of room. Just incredible endurance. So from the diagram, see, it narrows down here to 32 inches. And here it's the 90 inches. And this, they say, is a 20-degree angle. So you can see quite a coupe aerodynamic, of course, and that at least will remove vibrations, of course, just like a Ferrari. It looks a bit like a bullet, doesn't it, or a shuttlecock. Seems to be a lot of gear going on in the back. I'm not sure about any movement that's uh, given for all this back area. It's very hard to find out much about Gemini other than the uh, documentaries. But certainly no room for standing up here. What a brave man. Incredible. Just think of, you know, today's ISS and even Apollo. Sheer luxury in space uh, compared to the uh, real military style, just like a jet fighter, really. Being a jet fighter for two weeks straight. It's just phenomenal. And here she is here in the Smithsonian Institute with a nice glass panel so everyone can look in and see what a heroic mission Gemini truly was. And for all the luck that NASA's had in its space program, it just seems uh, so sad that they can never strike a sunny day. It's always cloudy on the ground, and that's so sad for a historic event here like Ed White doing the first spacewalk. And you can't even see the ground he's walking over all those miles up. Or flying over, I should say. No, another cloudy day for NASA. It just seems to plague them clouds. I'm hoping one day that they just, just are lucky enough to get a good uh, shot of old USA and a guy spacewalking. That would be fantastic.